Okay, then. Good morning. It's Ron. It's Sunday morning. We'll go ahead and get started. Let's see if we have any questions, as we always do lead off with questions. On well, yesterday, we, we uh, started off talking about an interesting article that, that uh, Nick found about uh, prisons in America and how they're run and uh, the profitability of them. And, and uh, we found out that this is, you know, is an old thing, something that's been going on for quite a while. Uh, that led us to speaking about racism and uh, that pretty much carried the conversation till the very end. And uh, Evelyn brought up a question about 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So as we went into that, kind of summed it up and tied everything together, uh, Pastor did uh, an explanation of that. And that's where we left off on yesterday. So any thoughts or questions about any of that? And uh, we'll look at address that first. And if you don't have any questions in that area, do you have any thoughts or questions uh, uh, from, from anything else that may grab you, have grabbed your attention? And good morning, everyone. Um, based on the, uh, the article that was brought to the table on yesterday, uh, just as a suggestion, make sure that we are not the individuals that's creating an arena for people to steal. And uh, because if we're creating an arena for people to steal, we're, ne we're, we're just as comparable as prison. And what I mean by that is I have three vehicles that I am in ownership of. I can only drive one vehicle at a time. Ron lives around the corner from me. He has access to two of those vehicles. Craig, Leslie, and Laura live down the street. They got access to the vehicles. Joe, Wanda, Morgan, Jack, they live across town. They got access to the vehicle. So just make sure that whatever you are in ownership of, whether it be of material possession, your knowledge, your understanding, your wisdom, be sure to share it with people. And if you share your knowledge and wisdom, uh, not everyone will endorse your, your thought. And just if, if you feel like it brings some good to the table, just be the one to say it, yet make sure that we're not creating an environment for people to steal because we don't share what we have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else, thoughts or questions? Um, yeah. Hey, Nick. Hey, everyone, this is Nick. Um, I just wanted to continue with an idea that I think uh, we talked about yesterday uh -huh. in relationship to the uh, Bible verse that we talked about. Uh, I can't remember the exact verse, but one of the things it mentioned was that uh, the true spiritual warfare we're in, uh, engaged in is about pulling down strongholds. And I mentioned that a stronghold uh, is a consciousness. It is a, a uh, you could think of it as a calcified or stagnant mindset that we are uh, faced with dealing with. And part of what we do spiritually is attempt to change that calcified mindset. Uh, we attempt to pull down a uh, sort of collective pattern of thinking that represents a particular uh, way of being in the earth either positive or negative, et cetera. But it is, uh, when we recognize it must be changed, that is what we address. And that is what is being spoken of um, when we talk about spiritual warfare. It is the uh, confronting a particular collective calcified uh, negative mindset or consciousness and learning how to uh, 
through directing our own awareness and attention at it, uh, change it or loosen it so that something else can take its place. And I just wanted to follow up with what we talked about yesterday to emphasize that point. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that, uh, what, what those strongholds are. Uh, and and that's you, you're exactly right. That's in what we're in the process of doing now. Uh, I was looking at some scripture uh, that last night, Nick, and 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 uh, I mentioned it to Pastor. Like for example, some of the stuff that we talked about yesterday. Uh, that mindset has been in place for almost beginning of time, and. Uh, you know, I, I, I was telling Pastor, I say I get impatient sometimes about some of the things that we pray about it and not seeing results. So, but this is a, a, a if you if, if if you look at who we are and what we're doing, and and that's why the importance of all uh, of what we discussed yesterday and what you continue to discuss today, recognizing that uh, the spiritual man, that the, the the soul for man is beyond time. Uh, we are reaching beyond time to see these things, to do these things, because that's that's what's important. Uh, so yeah, the, these strongholds are being, uh, as you said, they've been in place for, seem like forever, and uh, yeah, so much so that it is the norm. Almost certainly, <laughs> yeah. People, you, you 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 see things that you know are not right or need to be spoken of, but it's the norm. It's been so out there so long, we always feel like these things are much bigger than us. And uh, there's nothing we can do about them. Uh -huh. Oh, go ahead. Um, I just want to speak, when you said uh, <clears throat> uh, ca calcified a uh, mindset, um, I, <clears throat> I agree wholeheartedly with that. But you, you know, uh, doing studies, they found that the um, the um, third eye uh, is calcified, and and uh, fluoridation causes it to calcify. And um, once you begin to search for enlightenment, then uh, it begins uh, the the uh, calcium begins to be removed uh, from the third eye. And you're able to see more. So, what I'm seeing, Nick, based on what you were saying, is that when it is spiritually calcified, there is a physical message showing us that what has happened in the spiritual. And when that's removed, everything else changes. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I yield. No, go ahead. So, thank you, Nick. So, when we fear what we see on the surface, is that uh, is it that I don't trust God? Um, yeah, that's my question. When I fear what I see on the surface, is it that I don't trust God? What is it? Why do I fear? And I, I may be the only one can answer that, but. I just want to know. I need help with that. I think it's more, more than not trusting God. I think it's that you don't know who you are. And when you truly embrace the reality that you are indeed Elohim, then um, you you remind yourself that uh, we were not we were not given a spirit of fear. But one of sober minded meaning serious, serious means seriously in search of spirituality. The the fears that we embrace have been fears that have been instilled in us by a mindset as opposed to by a spiritual truth. And and when we know the spiritual truth, the first spiritual truth we must embrace is that we are Elohim. We've been told that the, the uh, first physical, um, the first uh, spiritual truth that we ought to accept is that Jesus was the Son of God. But that's not true. 
the first one we need to accept is who we are. If you don't know who you are, then you have no clue as to why you are the reason you're in this earth. Neither do you have any clue about where you're going because knowing who you are speaks loudly to where you came from. Does that help, Elton? <laughs> yes, sir, a great deal. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, Pastor, that same question that you had asked. Do, do, when you know who you are, do you know what direction that you might get taken in? Not necessarily. Uh, first of all, the scripture says a couple of things that I think um, we've overlooked. Um, one is uh, in Acts, when the Ethiopian eunuch uh, says that he does not understand, he, what does he say? How can I understand unless I have a teacher? Well, in the, in the church, we have been taught to shun any teacher that does not toe the party line. To, to, uh, uh, to shun any teacher who, who uh, brings who teaches something that we have not uh, been told to teach uh, by those who enslaved us. When we began to do research on our own and, and began to teach it, we are pushed, uh, we, are ex we actually, we are excommunicated from the presence of those who are in church. Now, the other thing is that um, because uh, preachers in particular and, and um, seminary teachers or Bible teachers, so they are lazy and they are fearful of their positions. So they say, you, you got to study for yourself. Well, if you are a teacher, why would I have to study for myself if you're going to teach me? When Paul wrote that letter to Timothy, he was not writing to a congregation. He was writing to a preacher telling the preacher, you need to study to show yourself approved uh, uh, unto God. And so he's saying, if you, if you don't, if you're not a teacher, if you're not teaching your people uh, what's in the scripture, what, what's happening, you, you are telling them to learn on their own. And that's the worst thing that you can do. And why do I say that? Because as we did all the research we've done in the past years, probably the past two decades or more, uh, all the uh, studying we've done, um, there are books that we have access to that may not have but one paragraph in it uh, that is spiritual. And the rest of it is somebody's opinion. And and But... There are those who are being taught uh, who think that uh, they can teach simply because they read something. That does not mean that you are a teacher or being called to do that. So what happens when you tell people to study from themselves, they get confused. And when they come to ask a question, simply because you have not done the study, God didn't mean for us to understand all things, uh, everything in the Bible. Well, if he didn't mean for us to understand it, why, why is it there? So, so that doesn't make sense. Um, and I know that you know, some of you are, are saying, are probably thinking, well, why is it you don't want us to read? Because we don't want you to be confused. And, and there are those who, who uh, think that they are teachers because they are, have read something. They are the people who are expressing opinion and not truth. And that that's a also um, can be very confusing. Am I saying that you are not to read? No, I'm not saying you're not to read. But I am saying uh, that in your reading, bring the questions. And, and when you receive responses to your questions, if you're uncomfortable with them, we can discuss them more. Or you can do the research to find out what our response is and what it's based upon. So the reason we are confused now, when people are told uh, to study for yourself, think about it this way. If you are, if your car is broken, you go to a mechanic. If, if, that, if you are to study uh, for yourself, 
why don't you study how to fix your car? That mechanic specializes in that. Jesus never told the disciples or the apostles to study for themselves. He taught them. And when they taught, they were never told, they never told the people to study for themselves. They did the teaching. They were, they were um, tasked uh, to clear up the, the uh, misunderstandings. They were tasked to bring uh, the truth of the spirit uh, of the um, scrolls to the people. Now, you say, how do I know it's the truth? It resonates with you. You might not be able to repeat it, neither, um, so, and sometimes neither are you able uh, to uh, understand all of it, but it resonates with you. There was something deep inside of you, you can experience that truth. And, and, and uh, that is extremely important. And I reiterate this, reading books does not make you a teacher. I got a reading, question for you. reading books give you knowledge. What kind of the knowledge of, of religion primarily, but it does not give you spiritual knowledge because spiritual knowledge come through um, uh, revelations. Ron? Yeah, it, 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 I just wanted you to touch on in case somebody, we, we or, or Timothy, where it tells you to study to show yourself approved, tie that into what you're talking about. Um, it's simply that that uh, Timothy was being uh, encouraged to to study so he could give the, his congregation the truth, and 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 the what I'm talking about in, in essence is that we are not so we were not told to study for ourselves because. There are those who have been called to do the teaching. Now, as a religious people, we don't believe that people are called to teach. We truly don't believe that. The, the, the reason is because those who are teaching the truth about spirituality are teaching something that is totally different than what we have been taught in the past. And because of unwillingness to uh, let it go, or unwillingness to come with an open mind, uh, you, we end up having people to shun us or to move away from us. Yet, we must continue to do what we are doing. And that is making every effort to bring a clear understanding of spirituality to those who uh, the creator has given us um, for the purpose of teaching. Teaching goes far beyond the people who are on this, uh, this Zoom or phone, whatever you're on. Uh, it goes long, far beyond that because as we teach, as your questions are raised, it goes into the macro. I said one, a couple of uh, Sundays or Saturdays, whatever, sessions ago that, um, we don't want your opinion. We want your questions. We do not respond based on our opinions. We respond based on truth. And the truth that we, re that, that we respond with is the uh, understanding of the allegories that make up what we call the Bible. In order to do that, you have to understand uh, the uh, idioms of the language, and you have to search for um, the, the original meanings of the words that have been translated, most of it translated wrong, because it was translated to suit uh, people. Let me throw this in while I'm talking. Ask yourself this question. The Bible, Christianity, is, is 1,992 years old. That's how long it's been on the earth. 
spirituality has been on the earth for hundreds of thousands of years. So why is it that Christianity can tell us that everything that is not Christianity is voodoo or, or is um, suspect or is demonic, uh, if it, or idolatry, if it's not uh, uh, in line with what, they, what Christianity teach. Why is that so? When So how is it that we were able to manage for hundreds of thousands of years with spirituality and all of a sudden, a group of people come on the earth with something called Christianity, misinterpreting the scrolls and leaving out some of the books that give us a greater clarity of spirituality. And we are supposed to eat that. We are supposed to leave everything else and embrace that. And you and, and the people who are who brought Christianity uh, into existence, please it didn't come into existence with Jesus. It came into existence with the Catholic Church. And 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 the people who brought that into existence are the youngest people on this earth between eight and 10,000 years. So, so I, I ask you again, how is it that they would have a better understanding of, of what's spiritual than, than those who've been on the earth for hundreds of thousands of years? And if the creator um, were, has an issue with that, then why is it that the creator allowed them to continue to exist? And if Christianity was what it all um, what is supposed to be or what is purported to be, how is it that you can use Christianity as an excuse or uh, a as a policy to exterminate people, to um, to do uh, what is ethnic cleansing, and you justify ethnic cleansing by the scriptures? How is that so? What's happening in Gaza right now is being justified by the scriptures when that is a lie. People are, are buying into this because we have been convinced that Israel, the occupants of Israel, are the chosen people. That is not true. There was never a country called Israel until 1948. So all of these things we must take into context, uh, take in this context, if we are going to believe, I mean, if we are going to understand what spirituality is. Now, the other thing, the last thing I want to say about this is reiterating. Teaching is spiritual in nature. It is designed, it is given for the purpose of showing people who they are. The Bible does not teach us about who created us. The Bible teaches us about who we are, who we were created to be. And that is very evident when Jesus said, if you believe as I believe, uh, greater things than these ye shall do. So, uh, so keep your opinions and bring your questions, respond to questions, but, but please understand that this is not an area for debate. This is an area of discussion. Debating is for academics, not spirituality. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, questions or comments, anything, uh, questions about what Pastor just said? Okay. Any questions uh, about anything else that uh, you'd like to discuss? Nick was going to say something, Ron, and he allowed me to go first. Yeah, I can. The... Uh... The thing you study is yourself, and in studying yourself, you understand you can't understand uh, uh, 
how to draw on what is referred to as revelation. That's what you were saying. It is not that we need to memorize things we read, although, of course, as Pastor Richard also said, it's not that you shouldn't read. <laughs> it's that uh, what you draw from is not intellectual memorization of things, but rather uh, the influence of your own spirit as you are able to feel it as, and perceive it. Uh, as you are able to hear it. That is the mark of a uh, teacher as opposed to a preacher. <laughs> Whatever it is you are preaching. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say is that within the self, there exist strongholds as well. We were referring to that earlier. And fear is one such example. When you investigate the nature or yourself and quite simply try to understand the origin of whatever fear you feel, where it comes from, why you feel that way, uh, you engage in the process of bringing down that stronghold within the self. And it is the, the place where you see results, Ron, first is always in your sense of self and it is it, those results you find and uh, attain within the self reflect outwards quote unquote they uh, become the blueprint for changes in the macro that we wish to see so whatever thing we are dealing with internally or that we recognize you know we have questions about, etc. It is always important to investigate that uh, to know our own self better. Because when you understand how to solve the things uh, within, uh, those are those things that people deal with without. And it is uh, knowing the self, balancing and healing the self, that begins to resonate with the macro to with the uh, collective mindset with the collective stronghold or whatever we want to call it um, and then uh, that is how it is influenced so i think we think about it intellectually a lot but fundamentally the first thing you must deal with is your own self it is uh, those aspects of your own self that you recognize you don't understand or that you want to heal, balance, etc. That they are reflective of the things that exist in the macro because all people are similar. We all deal with the same things, just in different ways. But when you learn to know the self that exists within uh behind and deeper than those uh, strongholds within, when you learn to get past them, when you learn to heal them and balance them within the self, that is when the, what is referred to as revelation comes more clearly. That is when your ability to hear becomes sharper. That is when your uh, capacity to function as a teacher in whatever circumstance, including on the phone call uh, that we're on, becomes uh, that much more a part of your lived awareness. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Very well said. Uh... Yeah, you, you you summed up what we've what we've talked about almost uh, or, or try to say in, in most of our lessons is you change the world by changing yourself, and uh, getting to know oneself is is the key to this. I, I the the part I had not considered though is the strongholds, uh, the strongholds that are within us that we sometimes uh, don't always deal with, try to avoid. 
Thank you. Anyone else? Good morning, Ron. This is Kathy. Hey, Kathy. I wanted to speak to what, good morning. I wanted to speak to what Nick just said because as he was speaking, I started to think about those internal strongholds can sometimes be very subtle. And you may not even know that that mindset, that calcified mindset or the mindset that is set in concrete is even governing the decisions and the thoughts and the actions that you're carrying out. So I guess when I'm thinking about this, the first thing that comes to mind for me is do you trust the teaching that you're receiving? If the answer to that question is yes, then your next benchmark is what growth have I, as a result of sitting under this teaching, what growth am I experiencing? If your answer is you still think the same way about life and you still view life through the same narrow lens that you've always viewed things to and you still react the same to things even though you've been taught for many, many years, then you may not even realize or recognize that that is a stronghold, an internal stronghold that's keeping you from growing spiritually. And I think that's very important because, like you said, I think it was a great point of view to point out that there are internal strongholds. But my question became, do you always recognize it? Because it can be subtle. And to me, the benchmark is if I'm talking the same way I've been talking for 30 years, and I'm debating with you whether or not what you're saying I agree or I disagree with it, and all of a sudden I, I get off the phone and nothing has changed. I, I feel like the reason we call in is to grow spiritually and to have a better understanding of who we are. And if we are not changing and we are still stuck where we've been all along, then that is a stronghold that we may not even recognize. And I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well worth stating. Anyone would like to address that? For, for confirmation, Ms. Kathy, did I hear you correctly that you should trust the teacher's teaching? Did you, is that what you said, Ms. Kathy? That's exactly what I said, yes. Okay, no, well, my stance. Student? My sorry, stance ahead, on that is, my stance on that is I respect what I respect what you all teach. Yet I am still obligated to do my own research on what I heard from you all. So um I hope you all don't take that in a in a negative way because that's why we didn't got in this position. We trust what the district superintendent said in the United Methodist Church, and we ain't never questioned them, or we ain't never did no research on our own. So I trust what, what, what the teachings that come forth from Greater New Faith Foundation or teachings in any arena. However, I am still obligated to put a little sweat equity in to investigate and research what was said, the error it was said out of. So um, when I teach or I train, uh, you have every right to question me. You have every right to do your own research. Uh, so I hope, you know, like I say, I respect what you all say. And you don't even have to be a teacher. I just respect what you say. Yet if you say something, I'm still obligated to do my own research on it to draw my own conclusion. Thank you. I agree with that, George. We are not. Oh, I'm sorry, Pastor. No, I, I agree with that. That's what Nick and I were talking about earlier. Um, nobody's telling you not to read. No, nobody's telling you that at all. But we are saying that um, the depth of teaching comes from those who have been called to teach. That's all we're saying been chosen to teach. That's all we're saying. I mean, and you... Pastor, may I add to that? Yes. We're not, I agree with exactly what you're saying, but every one of us recognizes that spiritual growth and the spiritual journey comes as a result of questions. When you study, it, not, it is not to amass knowledge so that you can come back and say, look what I know. 
and say these things, spiritual journey, spiritual truth starts with questions. And as you're studying these things, there should be an awakening inside of you that questions, okay, now why is this this way? And then you come back with your questions and we discuss those things. So by all means, we're not saying never study for yourself, but there should be an awakening going on as you're studying that leads you to a place of seeking truth. And if I just study and continue to amass knowledge in my head and never have any questions about anything, then what is the purpose of my studying? Am, am I studying to back up and, and authenticate just what you're saying? Because I know, and I can only speak for my own spiritual journey. As I read scripture, I had questions. As I read books, I had questions. And I brought them back to Greater New Faith, and I brought them back to pastor and the teachers, and that's what opened me up to growing spiritually. So when we are looking at things, it is for to seek information so that we can better understand who we are in this journey. So it should awaken any questions in you is all I was saying. And so I just wanted to not leave that point out. Thank you. To me, let me say this before you continue, Pastor, please. To me, this very discussion and what we do is talking about the lesson we had on last week about those that come in the late hour. The teachers came in the early morning. Pastor was called, then we were called. And each of us came at whenever we were called to do this. Those that came in the, in the latter part of the day are the ones that receive it. We all receive in the same message. We're all receiving the same message. So to me, this is a, a, a very good uh, discussion about that, that lesson we were talking about somewhere, uh, the, 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 some call to the vineyard in the early morning hours and some call in the late evening. This is a great lesson about that. But uh, that th those that were, were called first uh, have a greater um, um, responsibility. So that's the part I, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Thank you. I just... um, first of all, we are not saying don't read. However, one of the most difficult things to find is translations from the Aramaic. We searched for years to uh, <clears throat> find material that was based on the Aramaic language that the New Testament was written in. And to this day, there are fragments that we find and we share them with each other. And, and that in itself uh, makes a huge difference. Because if you look at the New Testament, what you're going to find in the concordance are Greek translations. And we have found that whether it's Greek translation or whether it is, which is called the Septuagint, or if it is an English translation, they are, they, they, when they're weighed in the balance, they come up missing something. But when we look at it from the Aramaic, we, can, we see it differently because of the fluidity of the language. The other thing is, I want to share with you a couple of things when it, as far as the teachers are concerned, because I have been reluctant in the past to um, talk about teachings, and it, and it dawned on me uh, that the reason that I was reluctant to speak about teachers, uh, us being teachers rather, is um, people have um, an affinity uh, for disrespecting our teachers or by saying that teachers think that they're above us when that is not the case at all. We recognize that we're servants. Uh, and the way that teachers were, are chosen is predicated <clears throat> on, on um, the, the uh, God, is based upon the guidance of, of, of the spirit. There were, I mean, Nick, I'm sure you don't mind, but me saying this, but Nick, when Nick was um, 
chosen to teach. Nick was simply told, um, you have a lesson for next week, right? And that was it. Um, Barbara was chosen to teach the same way, and many others were chosen uh, to teach that way uh, by simply recognizing what the Spirit was saying to us. In the case of Kathy, in particular, uh, there were those who, was someone who felt like they could do what she do, was doing in teaching. And they, and I said, no, it's not as easy as you think. And when I got to a place where I was feeling very strongly to uh, give this person the opportunity to, to do it, when that person went in the room, because that during that period, we also had Sunday school. And when that person went into the room with Kathy to teach, in five minutes, she was done. She had nothing else to say. Because what she was teaching was her opinion. And, and keep in mind, um, when we think about when you think about Sunday school, we have never been, we're not the classical Sunday school folk. We we stopped using Sunday school books. You had to prepare the lesson based on your heart. And that 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 was not done. So I say all of that to say this. Teaching is not as simple as you think it is. It's just, just like everything else. It appears to be easy because you know what you're doing. It requires and does require a ton of research simply to speak for an hour. And that's what we have done over the years, a ton of research. I mean, we were in the beginning, we would sit around the table, we mean in the teachers, <clears throat> it was 13 of us, 12 teachers and me, we would sit around the table. And what we would do is question scripture. And while we were talking about it, there were others doing research. We had laptops and books all over the table. And we traveled and, 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 um, and did this in, in conclaves. However, we got to a place eventually where we were seeing less laptop and less books because we had gotten to a place where we were open uh, to the revelation that we were speaking about earlier. And now we are at a place where we see far, be far more and far beyond that we have seen in the past. But the most important thing is this. We had no qualms about saying, I don't know. If a teacher cannot say, I don't know, then you're not a teacher. You are a perpetrator. Uh, if you think teachers are elevated and placed on the pedestal, you're not a teacher. Because teachers are truly at the bottom of the totem pole because it supports everything else. And when Kathy raised the questions, <clearly> uh, uh, talked about the uh, questions that, that we have been, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, the um, what, was, what was it, Kathy? The spiritual journey began. Very subtle. The strongholds that were very subtle, <clears throat> religious strongholds will tell you that anybody can do this. Anyone can do it in a church because nothing changes. The Sunday school books repeat themselves every five years. How do I know this? Because <clears throat> in the Progressive National Baptist Convention, I was asked to write lessons for Sunday school books, and I was told that they repeat every five years. That's not what we do. We are teaching you how to pull down the strongholds. We're, we're saying to you that you are more than what you ever thought you were. And yes, it is a struggle to wrap our mind around the reality that we are Elohim. However, it's not a struggle for those who are 30 and under or 45 and under. It's not a struggle. They are always talking about the universe and, <clears throat> and how the universe supports them and how they can how they trust the universe to guide their lives. 
That's not what we grew up with. We grew up with learning more about Jesus. So how can you learn more about Jesus when you don't know anything about Jesus? You know about what, what it says literally about Jesus. <clears throat> but the literal reading of the scriptures does not give you answers because the, li the literal reading of the scriptures were written from a mindset of ac uh, academia as opposed to spirituality. Therefore, we have to go beyond the academics and begin to look at the, uh, the spiritual understanding of what was written. And that is where uh, the test becomes. That's the task that we have uh, been given. And that's what we make every effort uh, to continue uh, to do. So, so um, again, no one is telling you not to read. What we are saying to you, uh, the reason we don't give you um, the books that we study from, because a lot of them, I pay $200 for a book. $200. Because I, I was led to buy that book. I got one paragraph out of that book. But it was worth it. One paragraph. And, and I've said to use this before. The Book of Formations. I read that book for 15 years and didn't understand nothing. Not one thing. I could read that book and close it and you and could not tell you what I read. For 15 years, I took it everywhere I went because I knew I needed to understand it. And one day, all of it lit up. The Creator will guide you. But guess what? Uh, your, 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 um, your, your test of dedication is how much you're willing to put in it and how dedicated you are to making sure that you're right by going back and looking at the same things over and over again. So you can glean from it what is needed for this earth for humanity to become one entity as opposed to separate entities warring against each other. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ron, Ron, may yeah. I say something, please? Of course. This is Evelyn again. I'll be the first to tell you, I did question what, I, what I've been taught there are times when I want to quit um, because it didn't, I, it didn't feel, I didn't, yeah, it didn't feel like I was changing internally. And I talked to Pastor about it. I'm like, I've questioned everything that you guys taught. The more that I open myself up to what's being taught, the more I got fed, the more I felt like I was growing, so to speak, as we call it. So I understand what Pastor and Kathy and George were saying, but when you want help, when you want your life to be changed, transformed, you ask questions for clarity. You, you know, what we teach is what, excuse me, not what I teach, but what you guys teach, um, soul food for me, because you were feed, you're feeding my soul. I want to change. I just want to put that out there. I question everything you guys taught. Yes, I wanted to walk away. This time I did, this time I did walk away, but I just walked away, but I came back because I knew what I had came out of, which is religion, which is school soul, if you ask me. But I just knew there was a change in my life. And so I just wanted to put that out there. I'm done. Thank you. Appreciate your honesty. Um, and and I concur. I, I, I too. I'm sorry, Pastor. Go ahead. Ron, um, what Ellen just said about desiring to quit. Let me share this with you. When when I first saw that what we what I was preaching. What I was teaching was wrong. I changed. And I, and I told the congregation about it. But what happened behind the scenes was different. Did I want to quit? Yes. 
because the pastors had been, they were turned against me because I was not teaching what was called Baptistic. I too wanted to quit because here I was, the guy who was a liaison between the state convention and, and um, the legislative body in South Carolina. And here I was uh, in contention to be uh, in a space where I would eventually become the president of the uh, Progressive Baptist Convention. Here I was in the association, a clerk and, and the director of education in the association. And all of a sudden, because I did not toe the line, I was ostracized overnight. Did it hurt me? It did. I wanted to quit. I remember going to a church and I was doing a pastor's anniversary and I said, I'm done. I'm not going through this stuff anymore. I'm done. So I would not preach from a scripture uh, with bullet points. I wrote a sermon just like all the rest of them would do. I wrote a sermon. And when I got to that pulpit and started delivering that message, a wind blew all my papers to the floor. And I, I, I was stunned. But then when I, when I opened my mouth again, what was coming to my mouth was the teachings that I had been shown. And at that time, it was talking about speaking in tongues. And I dealt with that uh, and what it meant. And that further, um, the anger towards me by those pastors who were leadership. I had a pastor. I tell you who it was. I have no problem with that. Rev. Sanders called a pastor who was going to do my revival and told him that I was not baptized and told him not to do my revival, told him that I, I, I studied from my own Bible that I wrote, told him all of those things that were not true. And the week of my revival, that's when I was told he could not come. He didn't call me. I called him uh, to, to make sure that everything was still on. And that's when he said he had other obligations. And that's when I found out who told him not to come to do that. That happened. So what was I supposed to do? The creator showed me to go to this particular place. I went and this preacher was there and he did it for me that week. And from that point forward, I should have been able to continue this journey without having any desire to give it up. But it did not happen. I wanted to quit several times. I had made a pact. No matter what I say about quitting, don't pay me any attention. I feel it, but do not let me go. And every time I felt like I wanted to quit, that voice would come to me or something would be shown to me outside the realm of um, normality in the religion and Christianity. And one night, this is what changed me completely. One night in the association, we were sitting there in a class and the class broke up. Immediately following the class, someone was supposed to bring a message. And we were walking out to the pulpit and the moderator got up, I came to me rather and said, you go preach tonight. And it was supposed to have been someone else prepared, but that was designed to catch me off guard. And when I did it, after that, I no longer wanted to quit, but it doesn't mean that there were times when I wasn't hurt. That's a huge difference. So why am I confessing this to you? Because I don't want you to think for a minute that, that this did not come with pain and suffering. I don't want you to think for a minute that I was not a Jacob running away from it. I don't want you to think that. I don't want you to think that I woke up and the Lord laid his hands on me. And from the time the Lord laid his hands on me, I was on this journey without a pain, without suffering. And, and y'all got to be the same way. That's crazy. It didn't happen that way. So I want you to, to hear me about all of us. We've struggled to be where we are. 
and I'm no longer apprehensive about talking about we, the teachers, because we are the teachers. We are the, the, uh, the, the ones who carry burdens for humanity. Not to say that you don't, but we are that. Thank you. And let me say, um, if you're on this phone and your desire to understand yourself and to break out of the uh, religious constraints that you feel that you are in is genuine, you will one day also be called to teach. But it will not happen within the, our context until it is recognized that what you, that where you speak from is spirit, as opposed to attempting to uh, fill space with things your intellect remembers. And that is not directed to anyone specific, but that is the nature of what teaching is. It is uh, responding to the spiritual desire of those who uh, pose questions uh, and knowing how to piece together things that you have learned from reading, etc., in the correct way. But it's not only that you need to, uh, you, having said that, you don't have to have read a single thing to be a teacher. It definitely will help. <laughs> but that is not where knowledge, capital K, in terms of spirit, comes from. Um, so, yeah, at no point do we want you to take things that just because we, quote unquote, the teacher said them. But we do want you to trust that what we want to help awaken within you is the same thing that we recognize awoke and is awake within us. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Pastor, thank you. Um, and I concur. I mean, I, I, I think at, uh, at some point, we all have considered uh, a lighter journey, doing something different. Uh, I could out, I'd be perfectly honest with you. If I had uh, long before the pandemic, uh, if I had someone take my resume seriously and aching, I probably wouldn't be here. You know, uh, I, I thought about it many times, but here I am, you know. And I'm glad I, I I'm I'm still here. I my my vision is different than it was there. That was kind of fighting against the current, seems like. But I, I love the discussion here, and I love the discussion on strongholds and and uh the the the, the question of strongholds makes you uh Nick talked about fear specifically, but uh makes you look internally. It, it keeps us looking at ourselves and because and, we, we keep saying nothing changes unless we change ourselves. And, and it reminds me of our uh, discussions we, we've had several times where we talk about rededicating yourself. Make sure you want to be here. Make sure this is what you're, you're seeking and why and, and, and uh, what, what is the desire to keep doing this. Uh, so that's, that's where we are. And, and I, you know, I, I agree with uh, everything that was said, even even George's question. That when I first came here, I, I questioned everything and, and still things uh, I, I, I look up. I, but the difference is I trust the teachers now. I trust pastors and the teachers. I don't, I don't look at it from that perspective anymore because I trust them. But it, it has to resonate with me. So a lot of times something said, I got to feel it. I believe it, but I want to feel it. So I may do research so so it, I can say it to myself and, and, and feel what that means. So uh, this this that's very important, very important discussion. The the feeling of it comes when you learn how to draw from that knowledge that exists within you. When it, it nobody needs to tell you anything because you know yeah. it because you are it. But in the beginning, the belief is, well, belief is always an important component of this because the belief is what continues you, what carries you forward in that progress, in that process. Yeah. But ultimately, what we, uh, 
do here is to help all of us, including me, uh, investigate our own self. So when you recognize that there's something in yourself that you want to deal with, how do you deal with it? How do you address it? How do you uh, learn to draw from spirit? How do you uh, be who and what you are that exists at a deep place than all this sort of intellectual et cetera stuff that is jumbling around in our heads? Yeah. And I remember when it, when I first started facilitating or teaching, whatever you want to call it, uh, one of the first questions I asked everyone in person was, what do you want? Because desire is the first key to unlocking the door within you. And you must be honest with yourself about what it is you want. Yeah. And if you don't know what you want, that's part of it too. It is difficult to figure that out. And it might not be uh, that you want to do whatever this is. What we all do it on the phone right now. That's fine. But whatever thing you recognize in yourself, you want to deal with or you want to accomplish or whatever, examine that and be honest with yourself about that. Everybody on the phone, everyone who's ever been on any of these phones or in person within this context, because following what you want, what you truly want, is the fastest way to enlightenment. <laughs> and if what you want is not to study any of this or even deal with spiritual things, that's part of it too. Because when the desire for the self awakens, you will not be able to deny it. You will not be able to quit. <laughs> As if I was able to stop. <laughs> and I'm sure other teachers were familiar with what I mean. Because if you've ever heard that phrase, uh, it's impossible to stop an idea whose time has come, or whatever the accurate phrase is. It is impossible to stop a true desire when it awakens. Especially if it is for... Uh, remembering who and what you are. Uh, and like I said, you will be called to teach if you follow that path long enough. Because teaching is a part of learning. There's no, you cannot separate those two. In teaching, you uh, sharpen and awaken your ability to draw from the source uh, where the information comes from that you that I say out of my mouth. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Um, this is yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you, Nick. Um, but I just wanted to interject. And I wanted, I agree with you about examining yourself. Um, and that's, that's the ultimate thing, is examining yourself and realizing what it is um, your desire is and who you are. But getting back to what Kathy was talking about, about those subtle strongholds, um, we have so, I mean, it's, it's kind of daunting to be in the position of a teacher because of all the things, all the things. Anyway, but getting back to the subtle strongholds, for people who are just um, just starting to realize who they are, um, it can be pretty daunting to to give up those things that you were taught by religion, or to give up those things that you were taught by your family. Um, to to not believe in the same things that your family believes in. Um, that's a pretty vulnerable place to be. Um, but in that regard, it is paramount that you do your own research 
that you talk to people you trust, that you follow what's what's in your inner self. Um, because yeah, those subtle strongholds can have, can really pull you back. They can suck you back down and suck you back in. Um, if, if you don't have the desire to continue, um, or if you don't have that spark within yourself that you're going to, you're going to follow through with what you you, what's resonating with you and what's going to, um, and what you really desire and, and that you really desire to know yourself. So I agree with Kathy, those subtle strongholds can be really, really strong. Um, so you have to kind of um, do your own research and talk to people and, and, and find out what it is that you really want and what your true desire is in terms of knowing yourself. Anyway, thanks. And, and Audrey, you know, good morning, everybody. Audrey, you know, I appreciate, you know, what you just said, because, you know, some of us have can relate to what you're saying in terms of our belief, you know, our knowing. And, you know, there's an African proverb that talks about man, know thyself. And, and as we, you know, continue this spiritual journey, I think to be open to holistic learning, you know, where we can appreciate our mind, body, soul, and spirit with regards to its relationship to the truth. Um, as we continue this journey, you know, we talk about being open and just being able to have a desire. So when we say that, the per, you know, again, and I'm just grateful, but the pursuit of truth, you know, is something that, again, you know, my words is not so much what's of most importance, but my heart. And the proof of desire is in the pursuit. You know, what, you know, what am I pursuing? And I think that if I can appreciate as Ron and we talk about the beginnings, then we have an opportunity to search and to seek. And as we now come to a better understanding, it helps me when we talk about the fear of knowing. And as Evelyn mentioned, you know, in the scripture, um, you know, first Timothy about for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, then it's a, you know, it's, it's a encouragement to me to be able to know that my desire is to be in pursuit of truth. And as I come to know truth, to be able to share it, you know, with family, not to, again, have someone to believe what I say, but as pastor sometimes said in the past, do you, you know, do your reading, do your study, you know what I mean? For the purpose of you being at peace. So I truly appreciate where we are today in reference to being open about universal principles, being open to not so much religion, but the heart soul of those that we come in contact with. So as you said earlier, um, you know, Audrey, I mean, with the family, you know, sometimes, you know, it's a struggle, but at the same time, be who the creator created you to be and uh, be the light and love and the principles of my, uh, that I come to know that I trust and believe in, you know, I'm, I'm done, Ron. I just wanted to share those. Things. No, what you said, I think is, is very important. What, what are you pursuing? I, it kind of follows up what Audrey and Nick said. Uh, mine did not start off pursuing truth. Mine started off pursuing me. Who am I? Why did you make me? Why am I here? Why do I go through all this stuff? And, 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 and then I, I started expanding. Who are Black people? Why do we catch hell all over the world? Why did you make us? That's, that was my start. 
and, and trying to figure that out and see us in scripture. And, and it blossomed into pursuing truth and, and recognizing that we're all one and, and seeing so. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I agree with you. You know, so in, in other words, we all may start you said something, you said the proof of the proof of your desire then the uh, we may all start pursuing something slightly different, but the desire has to be there. A, a, a sincere, strong desire is what has brought us here. Yeah. Thank you. I, several people had the hand up. I can't remember uh, or want to, wanted to address this. There were all, I want, all I want to say is that in order to be a teacher, you have to be an eternal student. That's it. Oh. Thank you, sir. A anyone else? Because I, I can't remember who all who was going to speak earlier. Ron, is, may, may I share one thing if uh, no one else is going to speak right now? Yes, ma'am, of course. I think about our journey as Greater New Faith. I don't know if anybody knows our history, but when pastor's ministry changed, there was a faction of, and we were, I'm speaking from my home church where we were when pastor was our pastor there. As the ministry started to change, those of us that believed what was being taught and could see the reality and the truth and the understanding of where this was taking us, even though we didn't have a full understanding, it resonated that this was real. Well, we were put out of our home church. And I mean, literally put out, could not come back. They didn't want him back. They didn't want us back. So we went for over a year, every Sunday, trying to go to a different church. Nobody wanted us. Because the word got out that we were Richard folks and blah, blah, blah. And like the pastor said, not following the, the Baptistic way. And when they would see us sitting in the congregation, we got a very chilly reception. And um, God laid it on Linda's heart to start looking for a building because we, we realized what we believe and what we're getting, we believe it so deeply that if you don't want us, then we'll go somewhere where we can continue to be taught in peace. And we had to ask Pastor, would he come back with us because he was no longer with us at that time? And he said, yes. And that's how Greater New Faith started. So the journey has not been easy, and I don't think it's been easy for any of us. And, and the problem with us, we wanted to go back, but there was nothing to go back to. It was like the whole thing was blown up, and it's like either you go. And the funny thing is that the one of the anniversary programs for Pastor, Martha and I had written a church covenant to him. And one of the lines in that covenant, which I still have a copy of, says, we promise to follow you as you follow God. And that's what we did. Had no idea what that was going to look like. Had no idea that was going to walk us right out the front door of the home church with a, a chilly reception to say, don't come back again. And it, this has never been an easy journey. But do I regret any of it? Not one moment of it. Because it took all of that to get us to where we are today. And so we, we don't talk about the history of Greater New Faith very much anymore because we moved beyond it because we recognize that it was, though it was a very hurtful time, it was a very necessary time to make us who we are today. But um, I don't think this journey is, this is not a journey for the faint of heart. If you say you want to believe truth and you want to see who you are, then you better be ready to stand by what you say you believe. And I just wanted to share that because I don't want anybody to think this has been a cakewalk. It has never been a cakewalk, but the biggest thing that we had to realize is that do you really believe what's being taught to you so much so that you will walk away from whatever is not resonating inside of you as true to pursue this, and that's what we had to do, and so I just wanted to share that, but thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Much appreciated, and you're absolutely right. I think we all have our own stories to tell individually and collectively. So quick, quick question to the, to the teachers or, uh, or people who just teach in general. Um, when Monique and I were dating or courting or when I was courting, uh, Monique didn't know how to drive a stick shift and, um, started out there in sky city parking lot, 
jerking and jerking. And, you know, then we got on the road and she would avoid hills because of the, the startup pattern, things of that nature. And once she got it, it was a, it was a, a very joyous moment for me because she, uh, she, she mat. I'm not going to say she mastered it yet. She was comfortable, you know, she was shifting gears and talking to me and, and, and she just got it. It was just a good feeling that my teachings of driving a stick shift was, I saw it come through. Um, on another case, uh, when I was at Pet Dairy, I went into a spot and I took the easiest spot to back into. I, I wasn't going to take that difficult spot. Not that I couldn't do it. I just wanted it to be easy. And another driver came in behind me, and he just backed that tractor up on in that hole. And I saw the person who got like, Slim, man, you backed that song going up in there good. And he said this. He said, quit saying, you taught me well. Um, because he did have some difficulty just coming out of truck driving school. We need a body, and we got to send you through a crash course stuff that I don't believe in. So I'm asking you teachers, have you all ever had that moment where you're looking at your, your, what you've taught and you, and you get that, boy, them folks finally got it. And do you get that feeling of accomplishment? Do you, if you understand what I'm saying, thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. Coach. Absolutely. And it's a good feeling because <laughs> it makes it means we have less work to do. <laughs> and it's the true goal of a teacher is to create more. Well, not just to create more teachers, but it is to uh, share what it is that we know, because we know that you also want to know it. And when you know it. Hey, and you will recognize the responsibility or your ability to teach the same when the opportunity arises. But yeah. My objective as a teacher is to teach myself out of a, out of a job. I, want, I, want, I don't want to die and everything falls apart. Um, teachers don't teach for notoriety. However, when someone says to you, I really appreciate you changed my life, that's exhilarating. You, you can't put a price on that. And, and, and I think that is exhilarating to all of us who are not only teach, but all of us who have um, encountered people and they asked us questions and those questions gave them the answers they needed or uh, to continue to pr pursue their life uh, in an easier manner. I think all of us uh, have experienced that and love every moment of it. So, you know, it's not like you're looking for a pat on the back. When the scripture says, I, get, I did not give you a spirit of fear, but one of sober-mindedness, um, you can't be afraid to say what truth is, regardless of where you are. And you have to be serious enough about the truth. And if you are, you don't have a problem saying what needs to be said or um, explaining uh, the errors that you have learned that you were taught in your life. So that's my that's my take. That's what I see, Ralph. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Pastor Nick. I have a question for Ms. Kathy. Uh, my yeah. question is, uh, ma'am, when you left and looking back now, uh, what happened to the people? Do, are they still the same? Do some come out? Do some track you down to ask questions? I'm just interested to know if you feel like sharing. Thank you. 
Oh, I don't mind sharing, um, and, and I'm talking family members. I'm not just even talking about members who are in that church now who who came along after we left. It's still a um, split in the sense of we are family. We communicate when we see each other. Now, they will call pastor and ask pastor different questions and things when something is going on because they knew that we didn't close the door on them. We made that very plain we still love you. We just see that it's more than what we're getting here. But they will still call pastors from time to time. I don't know if anyone has done it recently, but they will still ask those questions, and we are obligated, no matter how it went down when we left, we are obligated to still be there to teach them if they have questions. And so when everyone calls, if they have a question, we're going to take care of that question and try to help them to understand. They don't call me. They don't call often. But um, we're still family. So when we see each other, we still interact as family. But it's just a distance there now that, um, you know, I, I guess maybe it was there all along. I'm just not sure. But the point is, I don't regret anything because I will always view them from a standpoint of loving kindness. But even bigger than that, that and this is the growth that I've experienced. What they did to us was necessary for my spiritual growth. If they had not pushed us out, I would still be there trying to get an understanding of, of the scriptures that we were not getting, but just not understanding things fully because we had been in that church a long time. And it was when pastor came that things started to awaken in us. And we were like, oh, so there's more to this. But um, if they had not done what they did, I would dare say that because of this mindset of that is my home church, and I do my air quotes on home church, I would still probably still be trying to be there in my home church because there are people, my family's buried in the graveyard there. I mean, it's my home church, but I don't feel that attachment anymore because I'm not attached to a church building, a church protocol, and all those things that we once thought church was. We've grown beyond that. So it was necessary for them to do what they did to get us to really walk in the truth that we said we wanted to embrace. If they had not done that, we would never, I, well, I would never, let me speak for me. I won't talk about everybody else that left, but I don't think I would have ever walked in that truth if they had not pushed. And I'm glad they pushed. I still love them. I think they love me, but we just have a different relationship because they are still there with the running, the shouting, the hooping, the, all the stuff that, doesn't change your life. And so, and I have to accept that it is their free will, God given free will, stay there and be in that if that's what they choose, but I can't love them any less. So I hope that makes sense. Ms. Myra, did that answer your question? Do you have a follow up? Are you okay? Are you speaking with us? Still on mute. Now are you on mute? Okay. Maybe she stepped away. Uh, but thank you. Thank you for the question and the answer. Hey, Ron. Yes, sir. I, I was hearing in in in, in real voice and in the, the lady's voice. I know her name, but I can't get him. That um um I know when Pastor was speaking that he got ostracized from the other pastors, and I would and, and and I heard that um you know doing it you know he wanted to quit. It brought me back to what Jesus was doing when he was praying. He was, I mean, he didn't want to go to the cross. He didn't want to be killed. He didn't want to die. And he, and, and, but at that time, he changed it and said, Lord, let it be your will, not my will. And, and I heard that all he, what Real was saying, excuse me. And the other lady, when she got to talking, she was talking about Abraham. I'm still saying she was talking about 
um, a family and being around your family, how can you how can you leave? Because you want to know what you know your family what taught you, and then it brought me back to Abraham. Abraham had that same feeling, but he knew it was more than what his family can give him. Yeah, and yeah. He, and that was the reason he left, and he started seeing more, and that's how I, I saw it in between all of that. And Very I do cool. believe you know I'm, what I'm sorry. Kathy was saying. To Say what? I, I interrupted. I said, great example, I, I, but I apologize. I interrupted you. And I went through you know, the same thing that Sister Cassidy went through. I mean, I was in the world hard, you know, real hard. You just don't know how hard it was. Yeah. But like I said, when I, when I went through that church and like I told you before, I only went because my wife went, and I thought she was going somewhere else besides church. So I got up and started going to church, too. But as I was there and as I was going, I seen this little man get up and go to teaching, and he was saying things that I ain't never heard any other teacher had said. And that's what caught me to keep going. And then at the time I thought, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and as I was going, and then everything changed when they had this meeting. And it was a lot of people that I, I respected. I mean, I respect mm -hmm. them. I mean, I wouldn't do no wrong, wrong or nothing around them. But, it, you know, to know that, man, you don't do this. But anyway, making it short, they were saying some things, man, that I used to do in the club. And I said, this ain't, no, this ain't no different than the club and the people that I used to respect saying what they're saying and trying to do what they're saying. And the church got tore up. And I had a rough time trying to go to different places and be on, I'd be on solo at those places. I didn't feel the same attachment like I did when I was going to the church with, you know, with other family. And 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 like when the church went back together again, I felt like home. I, I mean, it, it felt like it was a good spot again. But like I said, you you, I mean, it was a hurting thing. But we start growing growing a whole lot different. I mean, we start growing in a way that you, can you can't understand the, the growth, the way I had become growing in this, in this other body. Yeah. And that's about as best I can explain the situation. Well, you, you brought up uh, something very, very important, Charles. I, uh, and everybody sort of said this. Uh, you, you, you can set your sights on being a, a, a pro athlete. You know what that journey sort of looks like. It's hard work. It's, it's physical and mental. You can set your journey on on being a lawyer, a doctor, whatever. You 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 kind of see what that's like. No, you don't set your journey to pursue truth and know what that's going to look like. It, it never looks like you think it's going to look. All uh, the, the things that you see, uh, you know, we look back on that took place. You didn't see at the time the chaoticness of how that was going to turn out or how you were going to turn out. So that's that's been part of the difficulty because you 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 never know that you know you're going through this thing not seeing the rough edges that uh, that's that's going to uh, have to take place so that you can can see yourself. So that journey that journey is is the same for all of us and it's different for all of us at the same time. Okay. But uh, great discussion, great discussion. I, I know it's getting late in the evening. It's like we've been on for an hour and a half, but I don't want to cut anybody off. Was there anybody else that want to address any any part of this that we, we've all uh, gone through? Okay, if, if not, we will 
we'll, we'll pause here. Seems like a great place to pause and uh, pick up tomorrow evening. Pastor, did you want to all talk about the number again and what you have to do tomorrow evening? Um, yeah, let me, let me add this first before I give the number again. I said each Monday is actually the uh, the 5th, the 12th, and the 25th. It's not it all. It's not. Um, it's not the uh, the twelfth, and um, the nineteenth um, is the twelfth. Is the fifth, the twelfth, and the twenty fifth. The number is, no, the um, ID, the meet ID, because it's did going to be. Wanna, Pastor, did you want to stop recording first, or, or did you want to? Oh yeah. I'm sorry to. Uh, I, yeah, I will stop recording now. Thanks. <laughs> 